This is C-SPAN's Afterwards podcast. This week, U.S. Court of Appeals Judge Amul Tapar discusses his book, The People's Justice, Clarence Thomas and the constitutional stories that define him. He speaks about the judicial philosophy of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas and recounts some of Thomas's key opinions. He's interviewed by USA Today Supreme Court correspondent John Fritzi. I'm pleased to be speaking with Judge Amul Thapar, who sits on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. His new book, his first book, is titled The People's Justice, Clarence Thomas and the Constitutional Stories that Define Him. Judge Thapar, thanks for joining us. John, thank you for having me. So let's start out with um, why you decided to write about Justice Thomas in particular. There are several uh, members of the court that um, espouse originalism in their jurisprudence. Why Justice Thomas? John, I was originally trying to write just an originalism book. So my goal was to write an accessible, interesting originalism book. And as you know, as an author, as someone who writes a lot, you often throw out your first draft. And what I discovered in that, in drafting that, I kept coming back to Justice Thomas. I thought his brand of originalism called original public meaning originalism was one where he consistently throughout his entire career laid out what I thought was an original, a purely originalist vision of the Constitution and the laws that govern us. And so... In doing that, I thought this was an interesting way to tell the story is through one justice's eyes. And whatever the other things I discovered is that he's not only an originalist, but he's a someone who has a black nationalist background that shines through in his jurisprudence and someone that cares deeply about people. And those three things really made it fascinating and interesting to study and hopefully interesting to read. You know that uh, Justice Thomas grew up poor, and I thought we might just talk about his background a little bit before we get into the substance of your book. Um, You write that, quote, people think dirt poor is a figure of speech, but for Justice Thomas, it was a reality. The floor of the shanty he was born in was hard packed dirt. Um, And and as you also write, uh, he would leave that uh, life and uh, ultimately be raised by his uh, grandparents. Um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about Uh, your perspective on how Thomas's upbringing may have affected who he is, uh, who he is as a justice, and maybe even his jurisprudence? I think, I mean, you've put your finger on so many important things there, because he was born to a single mother. His father deserted them, as he himself says, and his mom really tried her best to raise them, but she was making $10 a week. And just couldn't afford to raise him and his brother as much as she wanted to. And so she passed them off at a young age to their grandfather. And their grandfather really was important to the formative years of Justice Thomas, so much so that he calls himself my grandfather's son, as you know. And his grandfather had maybe impacted him in multiple ways, as I note in the book. The first is There's nothing you can't accomplish if you don't put your mind to it. He'd say when Justice Thomas or his brother was would complain, he'd say, old man can't is dead. You know how I know I helped bury him. The second thing he always believed and enforced is that even though he himself had a third grade education and struggled to read the Bible or the newspaper and would once he could successfully complete a passage of the Bible, for example, he would memorize it. He thought that in Frederick Douglass's words and words that Justice Thomas later uses, education means emancipation. And so he saved every penny he had, even though he was an oil delivery man, to send Justice Thomas, a young Justice Thomas and his brother to Catholic schools, which he did from really third grade through 12th grade. And he believed that was so important, so much so that he never let the boys miss a day of school. And he said If you are acting dead or you are dead, I will take you to school for three days to make sure that you actually are. That's how important he thought school was. And the third thing he taught Justice Thomas, and I'm quoting Justice Thomas as I recount in the book, is not to be enslaved to the views that others will assign him, but find his own views 
through study and education. And those three things, I think, come back throughout Justice Thomas's career and shine through. Your Honor, I have to say, um, you know, this is a book about the law and it's a book about Justice Thomas's jurisprudence and it's about originalism, but it's exceedingly readable for non-lawyers. And uh, everybody that I've seen interview you has raised this point. And I think it's because, um, you know, you, you did a really good job writing on this. And the reason why I think it's so readable for non-lawyers is that you focus on the people involved in these cases. Um, you know, as a reporter myself, we try to focus on the people, too, because that makes it interesting um, for our readers um, can you just talk a little bit about your approach to writing generally? Yeah. So, John, candidly, you write much better than we <laughs> often do. And I think that's we get trapped in the law. I often tell my law clerks in law school, you learn to talk and write like a lawyer for three years. I'm going to teach you to write and talk like a human being again. And what I mean by that, it's joking, but I was a trial lawyer originally and then I was a trial judge. And during that time, as a trial lawyer, you had to take com- concept com- and complex concepts, I'm sorry, and explain them to lay people. And I always did my best to do so. And as a trial judge, you really should write opinions, not for the lawyers, not for the bar, but for the losing side. And I always tried to accomplish that. My obligation as a trial judge was to explain to the losing side um, why you won or lost a case. One thing I noticed as you go up in the court system, meaning as I advance to the Court of Appeals, we often make the error, and I do so myself, and I regret it in hindsight, of forgetting that the caption represents real people. Why? Because we interact with other judges, amazing colleagues. We also interact with the lawyers, but we don't, like on the trial court, interact with the litigants again. And one thing I saw in Justice Thomas's jurisprudence is he really strived not to forget there were real people in front of him. And as you note in the book, the the individuals that struggle with some of the hardest circumstances imaginable and bring these cases in some ways are the real heroes of the book. And Justice Thomas is just the protagonist of originalism and it, the book hopefully demonstrates how originalism often benefits those we don't think it would. Yeah, that leads into my next question. I, I, one of the things that was very interesting to me is that instead of simply relying on the record, which you could have done, um, it's pretty clear you did some original reporting here. You did. Uh, it's clear you did interviews with the plaintiffs. Um, There's a lot of like interesting behind the scenes um, stuff with some of the advocates. Uh, involved in these cases. Tell me a little bit about why you decided to do that um, instead of just looking at the record. And tell me a little bit about what you learned from those conversations and experiences. Yeah, I learned there's some really amazing people. You know, as judges, we so rarely get to interact with the people that bring the litigation, right? And as I mentioned in the trial, judge, you did, but it was through the prism of the courtroom Whereas when I had the opportunity to interview the individuals and really the privilege of interviewing these individuals, I, I got the human side. It was able, it helped me better capture the human side that you can't capture in a cold record. And so what I mean by that is I would often read the record of the trial. I would read everything I could get my hands on, including articles written about the case, the case itself, the opinion itself. But I really wanted to capture what people were feeling, you know, for lack of a better way of describing it, taste, sense and smell. And I try to convey that to the reader. For example, if I can just pick one, I interviewed Angel Raish and another woman, Kathy McKee, two women that left an imprint on me in a way that I couldn't have imagined. Angel, in talking to her about the struggles with her health care and just getting to understand how much she had gone through. And then Kathy coming from nothing herself to become a star. And both of their stories are recounted in the book. But I think just talking to them and appreciating the struggles really gave me a sense of how to write the chapter in a way that could convey what they were feeling as well as what was going on in the court system. 
So before we uh, dig into a few of the cases, let's talk a little bit about originalism. I think uh, most Americans know Justice Thomas, and I suspect that most Americans don't really know what originalism is. How, how about uh, we start out with a broad question. Can you just define it for us? Yeah, the way I defined it in the book, and I think it's easiest to define, and then we can get into the details, is if you like, is originalists believe that the American people, not nine unelected judges, are the source of the law that governs us through the Constitution and statutes enacted by our elected representatives. And so what's a judge's role? A judge's role is to determine what the words of those documents meant when they were enacted. And then importantly, to imply, apply them to the present day cases in front of them. And as I say in the book, it's nothing more, nothing less. And the surprising thing about originalism is when you're an originalist, you're com- committed to applying the law equally to everyone. Sometimes that means the less sympathetic party wins, and you don't necessarily like that. But as Justice Scalia said, if you always picked your results, you're being a politician, not a judge. And you can't always like your results. But what I found and what I believe is originalism honors the will of the people. And in doing so, it more often favors ordinary people. And it, 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 in its honest application, it disproves, in my mind, the critics. In other words, the critics say that originalism favors the corporation over the consumer, the strong over the weak, the government over the individual, the rich over the poor. And I actually think the honest application of the original meaning proves the opposite is true. And that's really the thesis of the book. Judge, let me put you on the spot for a minute and and talk about some more of that criticism so that you can explain. Uh, I think, um, you know, one of the questions I have that comes up a lot um, in cases when I cover them at, at the Supreme Court is, you know, what happens when the meaning, the original meaning of the words isn't clear? Um, where do we go from there? How, how would you uh, how would you address that? How should justice yeah, different, different originalists have different approaches to that. I actually think that, John, is one of the hardest questions for originalism is what to do when meaning runs out. And so Randy Barnett, a professor at Georgetown Law, has written extensively about this. Others have written about it. In fact, I myself wrote a law review in the Yale Law Journal talking about it. Um, but at its core, If the meaning runs out, Justice Scalia, for example, believed firmly that that is when you would leave it to the American people to decide. And it doesn't mean they have to amend the Constitution to make it clear. What Justice Scalia often said is that I'd rather leave it to nine people randomly chosen from the phone book than the nine people in this building to decide the pressing issues of today. So what do I mean when I say it doesn't mean the Constitution has to be amended? It means that you can go talk to your neighbor, pass a local ordinance, pass a state law or pass a federal law. One of our greatest federal laws is Title VII that protects all of us from discrimination. That isn't in the Constitution. That's not the Equal Protection Clause. Rather, that is something Congress passed and signed into law and that we spend more time in the court system dealing with than we do often the Constitution itself. Let me throw uh, one other criticism that comes up a lot from the left, and that is that originalism seems to favor conservative outcomes often. Um, How do you respond to that? Yeah, I think the only way you can say that is by cherry picking the cases and defining. I don't like the labels conservative and liberal or left or right, because, as you know, John, from covering the courts, 90 percent, maybe 95 percent of the decisions, for example, in my court are three to zero. As we all know, just from looking at the last term, while a few cases are pointed to, I think I saw a statistic and you should correct me if I'm wrong where it was only 9% of the cases that were de- were decided 6 to 3 in the way that is often reported it should be 6 to 3 and all, there were many cases decided with with what I'll call or what the media calls strange bedfellows meaning people that don't or the public would not perceive ordinary lining up of and I don't blame the media for covering those cases they're often the most interesting in other words it's not the media's fault I actually think it's our fault in not doing a better job of talking to the public directly, even though, as you know, John, I don't love it, but I think we have an obligation both to write more clearly 
and make our opinions more accessible. Chief Justice Roberts once said, you know, I, I never put down a brief and wish it was longer. I think we could take that advice to heart ourselves and make sure our opinions get to the point are shorter and more accessible. So let me ask you one more on originalism, and then I promise we'll get to some of the cases because it's really good stuff. Um, I wonder, uh, Thomas uh, presumably has many more years on the court uh, if he chooses. Uh, I could also potentially see him retiring if a Republican president is elected. Who knows what will happen? I wonder um, who you think, um, if and when Justice Thomas leaves the bench, who sort of the next um, justice is who will take up the mantle of originalism You know, I think uh, we all agree that the court has become a textualist court, like uh, even some of the the justices on the left have sort of embraced that idea. But I think that maybe uh, that's not necessarily the case, uh, certainly on the left with originalism. And there may be some divisions within the conservative wing. I know you don't like those monikers, but within the, the six Republican appointed justices about originalism as well. So I wonder... Who else on the court uh, do you think um, has embraced this idea of originalism? Yeah, I think in some way, they, at least seven of the justices, including Justice Thomas, have. Um, and that may surprise you. But Justice Kagan herself has said that she is in some ways embraced textualism and originalism. I think Justice Jackson, to her credit, has embraced historical use and has been willing to debate the others on history. And so I wouldn't limit it, limit it to left, right, conservative, liberal, or Republican, Democrat. I, I dislike all of those labels, as you can imagine, John. So I know you do. <laughs> you're never going to come up with a label that a judge is going to like because we like to think of ourselves as individuals. And I think that part's important. It's hard to answer that question. And that's why I think Justice Thomas's originalism is so unique in many ways, is because He really, in a sense, captures what Brutus, the anti-federalist at the time of the founding, was worried about, that judges wouldn't adhere to the original public meaning. And he has tried his best to do so in the purest form possible. And who will grab that mantle on the court currently? I couldn't predict, but I can tell you there are many justices that respect the original meaning and respect the history. And as you said, They might have different approaches to it, but I still think we all, in some sense, do so. And even Justice Sotomayor, I shouldn't have left her out. I think she's a very thoughtful jurist who often will engage on the history as well. So let's talk uh, a little bit about a few of the cases, because I think it might be easier for viewers to understand um, what this book is all about if uh, we kind of walk through uh, what you're doing. Um, Each chapter, you look at 12 cases. Uh, Each each chapter is a case uh, where you talk about sort of the the background of the case and the parties, the story of the case, and then you talk about the argument and how uh, the the case turned out at the Supreme Court and then with a specific eye toward uh, Justice Thomas. I wonder um, if you could talk about how you define these cases. How did you decide which cases that you were going to highlight in the book? Yeah, so as a judge, I think we all appreciate that when we write for more than one, meaning write a majority opinion, we try to form a consensus. In other words, the writing is not purely our own because there's a back and forth. What I, In my mind, a very healthy back and forth amongst judges or justices in reaching consensus, in reaching a majority and making sure that the majority opinion reflects the opinions of the people involved, the people that sign on. So one thing I really look for is where Justice Thomas wrote for himself. Others may have joined his opinion, although often they didn't. And so where he wrote for himself, I thought you could capture his true voice. And that was my goal. If you'll notice in the book, All 12 chapters involve an individual writing by Justice Thomas himself. So let's talk about Kelo. Let's get into the first chapter of the book. Um, This is uh, Kelo versus City of New London. It's an important takings clause case that anybody who follows the court is familiar with. Um, uh, Decided in 2005, I think. Um, Tell us a little bit about uh, that case and what we should take away from Justice Thomas's Um, writings in it. Yeah, so I'm going to give you the factual background first, and then I'm going to pause and let you ask questions, and that way I don't go on for long. But I think it's important, as you 
as you probably gathered from reading the book, to understand and appreciate the factual background. Suzette Kilo was someone who was a little down on her luck. She was getting separated from her husband. She was looking for a place to live. She was a paramedic by trade. And she found she wanted a view of the water. That was her dream her whole life is to have a porch where she could go out and sit after a hard day's work and look and gaze at the water. And she found a place in New London, Connecticut, in a blue collar neighborhood. It was a really rundown house, so much so that the real estate agent was embarrassed to sell it to her. But she insisted that this was the house of her dreams and she bought it. She knew to fix it, she would have to put in her own blood, sweat, and tears because she didn't have the money to do so. But she also wanted to get the money to make the house perfect. And so she enrolled in and took correspondence courses as a nurse and eventually became a nurse and was a nurse and a paramedic and saved her money and put every dime into the house, making it absolutely perfect. It was so perfect, she painted it Odessa pink. And after she was done. This was one of her favorite colors. It actually turned out beautiful. And she even put her name on the house, called it the Kilo House. Well, while this was going on, what she didn't know is a storm was brewing. The city of New London was seeking to bring in a corporation. And they found a partner in the Pfizer Corporation. And the Pfizer Corporation wanted to come in and partner with the city of New London to, re, to kind of clean up and then move into an old mill site. But they didn't just want that site. What they also wanted was a large amount of property where they could put a health club, upscale, upscale condos, uh, some nice upscale restaurants and shopping. And that was Suzette Kilo's blue collar neighborhood. And so they asked, the, told the city of New London that in order for them to come in, they would need that neighborhood transformed into this type of community. The way the city proposed in doing it was using a process called eminent domain, which says a government can take your property for public use with just compensation. What that means is widening the road or putting in sidewalks, as Justice Thomas explains, those are the type of public uses originally understood, something where the public would actually use the property. Of course, Suzette Kilo and her neighbors, the dairies who'd lived there so long, their family had been there 100 years, they loved the community so much that when one of their kids got married, they put a down payment on on a house in the community so their whole family could be there. When these neighbors and Suzette Kilo heard about this, they wanted to fight it because they didn't believe it was for the public use. So the court uh, ultimately sided with the city in this case. Uh, Tell me a little bit about um, uh, that ruling and then um, uh, Justice uh, Thomas's dissent. To understand the majority's ruling, I think you have to understand a case that Justice Thomas discusses as well named called Berman. So Berman is from the 1950s in the District of Columbia, and I'll be really quick on the facts here, but D.C. wanted to take some area they called blighted and replace it with apartment buildings and condos and restaurants and other things. And the Supreme Court said that was okay because it was for a public purpose. Notice the change in words. They went from public use to public purpose and displaced a large number of residents as a result to take this property. What Justice Thomas points out in dissent is, and he's the only one, he writes for himself here, Justice O'Connor writes the principal dissent, it's a 5-4 case, Justice O'Connor, Justice Rehnquist, Justice Scalia, and Justice Thomas joins the principal dissent, but then he writes his own dissent, and he points out a number of things. First, Justice Thomas is the one justice that goes back to the original meaning. Why is he the only one and not Justice Scalia? Well, the Institute for Justice who litigated the case did not believe they could get five votes to go back to the original meaning. So they argued that a corporate purpose, meaning Pfizer's, was not a public purpose. They lost that argument because the majority believed they should defer to the legislators and others as to how what is a public purpose. At argument, Justice Scalia asked a really important question that I think Justice Thomas's dissent really captures. He asked if you take from the poor and give to the rich because they pay higher taxes, would that be a public purpose? And the city's lawyer said yes. Justice Scalia, you can tell, was puzzled. So he asked the question again. You mean you can take from A and give to B if B pays higher taxes? 
Again, the city's lawyer doubled down and said yes. Justice Thomas then is in his dissent runs with this. He accepts. I combed the amicus briefs. The one amicus brief that stood out and asked for the court to return to the original meaning was the brief by the NAACP. And it's a very powerful brief. And it points out how eminent domain is often used by cities and others to prey on poor communities and minority communities. And that was the NAACP's belief. Justice Thomas then cites statistics and other quotes, some really abhorrent quotes that were that government officials made. I'll leave it to your viewers to read them. I, I don't want to reproduce them here, but really awful things people said. But he points out that in Berman, 97 percent of the people that were displaced were black. He also points out that when we get away from the original meaning, often the poor And the less fortunate, those that can't take advantage of the levers of government, they are the one that lose. And so he believed that they should return to the terms public use, those that are actually provided for in the Constitution itself. And he he says things like this is a suspiciously agreeable thing to the Pfizer Corporation and his dissent. He points out how, and I'm quoting him, something has gone seriously awry when the government can't search your house without probable cause, but they can take it away. Um, So he says you're safe in your house, but not safe from the government taking your house. And he, I mean, his dissent is really worth reading in itself, but I hope the chapter captures all of that, as well as the really, what I would call damning statistics about how often this is used to prey on poor and minority communities. Uh, that's a great uh, retelling of the chapter, and it's a, it is a really interesting story. I learned a lot. I've read the case before. I learned um, a lot uh, still reading this chapter of your book. Um, uh, one of the things you got at um, was is interesting to me, and I've wanted to ask um, uh, a judge who embraces originalism this. Um, this case in particular, I think, as I understand the majority opinion, was talking a lot about deferring to um, the legislative branch, in this case, the city council. Um, And uh, as I understand the majority opinion, it frequently is sort of returning to this idea of, well, uh, we'll let the elected officials decide what public use means. And it made me wonder if there is a tension sometimes between originalism um, and the idea of judicial restraint and how you reconcile those um, those two goals. Yeah. So that is, that's another really interesting question. And to me, judges have an obligation when, as you said earlier, meaning runs out to leave it to the other branches to solve the problems of today. But they don't have that. In other words, this restraint activism labels aren't appropriate when the Constitution specifically speaks to something. Then it is a judge's obligation as Chief Justice Marshall long ago said to announce what the what the Constitution says and enforce it. Nothing more, nothing less. And so here the government is only allowed to take your property for public use is the words of the Constitution itself. And we can't defer. It would be. And Justice Thomas talks about this in his dissent. It would be really odd if we deferred to the government as to what was probable cause We never do so. And why would we defer to them as to what's a public use? The Constitution specifically requires them to comply with those provisions. And it's our job to enforce that. If the courts don't, no one will. Uh, What do you think the impact of Kelo has been? You know, I point out in at the end of the chapter that as a result, the Institute for Justice and others passed a number of laws in 45 states protecting individuals from this type of thing happening, luckily. But there's still some states where they haven't. And there's many states, including Connecticut itself, as I understand, that hasn't passed a vigorous law to protect individuals. And as Justice Thomas noted, the Constitution was supposed to do that. The other thing, so your viewers know, is... Pfizer did come in and to to create what they believed was their wonder drug, Viagra, in New London, Connecticut. But eight years later, they left. And so now over 10 years ago, they left the city of New London. And that the field itself 
where it, the how where Suzette Kilo's house is now a barren field, and I went there and took a picture of it and reproduced it in the book, so the the reader could see that field and see where her house once stood, and there's nothing there today. Hmm. It's amazing. Um, you know, uh, I want to turn to Zelman in a minute, but before I do, um, uh, Justice Thomas was in dissent in Kilo, as we discussed. And I, by my count, he was in dissent in, in nine out of the dozen cases that you uh, highlight here. What does that say about uh, Justice Thomas or uh, what do you think it says about the court? You know, I think what it says about Justice Thomas is he took his grandfather's words to heart. And he's always he believes that his job is very well defined to interpret the original meaning of the Constitution. And he'll do it as one chapter I title, even when he has to stand alone. He doesn't mind standing alone if he thinks it's right. He thinks it's important to give that voice and provide that voice on the court. And, you know, different justices have different views of stare decisis. We don't have to get into the weeds of that. But Justice Thomas's view is the Constitution is supreme. And he will always, in his mind, revisit precedent that he thinks is really wrong, to use a simple term. And others have higher standards in revisiting precedent. And so we obviously, as judges, operate against a backdrop of precedent that many on the court, for good reason, are not willing to revisit. But Justice Thomas is always willing to revisit that. And what I was trying to do in the book, if you go back to the original question you asked, is I was trying to capture what an originalist constitution would look like in today's America. And I think Justice Thomas is the best way to do that, I found. And sometimes that means he ends up in dissent. Let's talk about one in which Justice Thomas was in the majority. Um, Zellman is a fascinating case. I think it's the second chapter of your book. Um, You have uh, not a personal connection to it per se, but uh, you did grow up in Toledo, uh, just a couple of hours west of uh, where this story takes place in Cleveland. Um, Tell us about Zellman. Yeah, I mean, Zellman was so much fun for that reason, because I was growing up at the time all of this was going on. I remember George Voinovich. George Voinovich was a local kid from Cleveland, went to the public schools, became a successful mayor, turned the city around in so many ways, ran for and became governor. But he knew one thing was failing, and that was the public school system in Cleveland, so much so that I included quotes from different news articles I found where they'd say things like society's going to hell and the Cleveland schools are going with it. And the problem with the Cleveland schools is between 14 and 25 buildings were beyond repair, so much so that kids were complaining. They didn't have soap. They didn't have toilet paper. They weren't learning. I mean, 9% were passing the ninth grade proficiency test, if I remember correctly. It's, It's recounted in the book. And uh, George Voinovich wanted to create a solution. And he turned to Bill Batchelder, who was the leader of the assembly at the time, billed and partnered. It was a bipartisan bill. Patrick Sweeney, who was a Democrat, the leading ranking Democrat from Cleveland, partnered with Bill Batchelder. And they partnered with some amazing figures in Cleveland. I recount the stories, including Fannie Lewis, maybe one of my favorite people in the whole book. This woman also grew up in the South, like Justice Thomas. She came and uh, criticized city council. She lived in Cleveland. She eventually runs for city council from the highest crime ward and gets to know everyone in her ward, so much so that people would say she's the safest person in Cleveland because if you mess with Fannie Lewis, she'll call your mama because she knew everyone. And Fanny was someone who championed the public schools, a public school product herself, but believed firmly that she wasn't going to leave kids behind. And they all partnered together, along with the Catholic schools, to put together this the first in the first in kind voucher program. And this case, the voucher program ultimately gets challenged. You can read the chapter. It goes through the challenges to the in the Ohio courts and then ultimately ends up in the U.S. Supreme Court. And talk a little bit about, you know, where it goes from there and how Thomas connects this uh, issue to originalism. Yeah. So Justice Thomas in Zellman, one thing that's important, chapters two and three, two is about vouchers. The name of the chapter, words Justice Thomas uses in his own opinion is education means emancipation. Chapter three is about affirmative action. 
And I think it's important to characterize Justice Thomas's views here of the Constitution. He believes that affirmative action is an unconstitutional band-aid on a much bigger problem, which is the failing school schools that often fail our poor and minority children. He doesn't only believe, obviously, minorities are impacted by this, but throughout the country in poor communities, children are often left behind. And he uses the words in his opinion, he quotes Frederick Douglass often throughout a lot of these opinions, and he quotes Frederick Douglass here, education means emancipation. And he, he, he believes that misconstruing. So what happens just really quick is the court upholds a voucher program where you can use vouchers for community schools, magnet schools, um, private schools and Catholic and re- other religious schools. And that's the hook that the union and others challenge it on is they believe that using it for Catholic schools and private schools violates the Establishment Clause. Justice Thomas points out in in a number of ways in his separate writing how it would be contorting the Establishment Clause to say a parent's choice is governed by that in really simple terms. And what I mean by that is the voucher program was such that the money, the voucher went to the parents to use as they saw fit. And one other thing I should mention is they could also choose to get a voucher, not send their kids out of public schools, but use it for tutoring. So the program was aimed to really enhance the educational opportunities for Cleveland kids and give their parents a say. And in fact, they created a Twitter page for the book. It's called The People's Justice, if you put it in Twitter. And the backdrop is the Cleveland parents at the Supreme Court who overwhelmingly supported the program. And Justice Thomas really gets into the details of what's going on, how the schools have traditionally failed these people, how that's the created the problem in higher education. And we shouldn't put an unconstitutional Band-Aid on a much bigger problem. Rather, we should fix the bigger problem. And one way to do it is vouchers. And we should not restrict a parent's choice in doing so. Judge, you know, I'm curious, um, uh, you were mentioning uh, the Establishment Clause, of course, uh, came up as part of uh, that case. And, you know, this case, that case is over, and the cases uh, that you write about here, of course, have been decided. But some of these are still live issues. Uh, certainly, the Establishment Clause in education is still very much an issue. It just came up this term. Um, and I wonder how you think about that. I know that judges are always very cautious about what they want to say um, uh, if a case could come up in their court. Um, uh, certainly, we see the American public really sees this at confirmation time in the Senate. Uh, you know, the justices and Article Three judges generally are very hesitant to say anything. How did you navigate that with this book? Um, I don't think you crossed the line, but how do you feel about it? How did you figure out how to write about these issues passionately, I think, but without um, tipping your hand for a case that could uh, could come up in your court? Yeah, I think it's really important that when I got, you'll notice this, John, in the facts sections, I often recounted with end notes so you can see my sources what the facts were. When I got to the legal section, one thing I often did is I quoted or summarized without any editorial comments, because I do think it's important that we as lower court judges and even justices ourselves approach cases with an open mind. One thing that I think is important in the American public, and maybe all of us don't appreciate, is we are bound by the arguments the parties make. And so we talk about principles like forfeiture. There are often things that come up. This is another reason Justice Thomas may find himself in dissent, and some people may sign on to the majority. You may wonder, how does that happen? And what I wish the public understood, if they're on Thomas's side, why the majority did it their way or vice versa, is that often they are constrained by the arguments of the litigants. And we too are. So one thing that's really important is that as judges, we understand and appreciate that and let the litigants control their case or controversy. That is something Article Three, in my mind, requires us to do in many ways. Um, is allow the litigants to control what goes on. And we as judges have to remain bound by that. So when I got to the legal section of the book, I tried not to recount in an editorial fashion what was going on, but rather to tell, use their words. I often quote Justice Thomas and quote the majority or summarize it straight from the opinion itself. 
The cases you highlight cover a pretty wide range of time. I think Zellman was the first, maybe early 2000s. Um, and then you also have a really interesting case. Um, it's a, a denial of cert um, uh, that came from 2021. I, I wondered um, if you noticed any change in Justice Thomas's jurisprudence or his approach uh, over that time span. And uh, maybe another way to put the question is, uh, is there anything, uh, if you had had a little more time, is there anything, any case from this term uh, that just wrapped up that you uh, would have loved to include maybe in a follow-up book? You know, I think Grutter was chapter three. It's the case that students for fair admission overturn. You, you really can't appreciate what he did in students for fair admissions, meaning Justice Thomas's separate writing, without looking at Grutter looking all the way back to when he first came on the court and was championing. He's been a champion of historically black colleges for a long time. Even in Students for Fair Admission, he recounts the remarkable success that historically black colleges have had for black Americans. I think it's his way of responding to the critiques of what he views as he calls them the cognoscenti, both in the uh, Ed Voucher's chapter, how they really don't want these poor, he, I, I don't want strong words, and I don't think that's fair even to put in Justice Thomas's mouth. They want pe- everyone to succeed. I think everyone in America wants everyone to succeed. I think we shouldn't assume the bad faith of people that think that there's a different path to success. But I think what he says is, I he grew up in the segregated South. He appreciates and respects historically black colleges and points out the remarkable amount of success that people have had from those colleges. I would love. So this is a long winded answer of saying all those cases together. I would love to write a chapter on the historically black college cases and maybe blended together and Justice Thomas's view of those schools, because it just keeps coming through in his jurisprudence. In a case called Missouri versus Jenkins, he says it always it never ceases to amaze me that people assume that anything that's predominantly black is inferior. He's always really offended when you when you think that or say that, it seems to me, and it shines through in his jurisprudence. So, Judge, uh, let me put you on the hot seat for a question or two. Um, As you know, this book is coming out at a time when the Supreme Court is under uh, an immense amount of scrutiny, uh, including uh, Justice Thomas, um, uh, for the activities of justices outside of the court and questions about ethics. Um, In your conclusion, you write uh, about Justice Thomas. Um, You note that he uh, has liked to spend time with uh, regular Americans. Uh, You know, he we all know that he... uh, uh, and his wife uh, do a lot of RV camping. Uh, You write that, uh, quote, it makes sense that a justice who would rather spend his time in Walmart parking lots than at cocktail parties is an originalist. Um, How do we square that with this image of Justice Thomas that has um, emerged, I guess, over the past uh, several weeks uh, in stories dealing with uh, private jets and um, exclusive uh, resorts uh, around the world? Yeah, as you noted, that came out after the book was published, or at least around the time. Someone asked me, John, um, did you know this was coming out and write the book in response? And my answer was, if I could do that, I would give up my day job if I could produce books that quickly and become a writer. You know, I don't have John Grisham like talents where I can produce amazing books in a short amount of time. But um So I'd say three things to answer that. One is Justice Breyer sat next to him for 28 years. When these allegations came out, he said he's a person of integrity. I've never seen him do anything underhanded. I've never heard him say anything underhanded. The second thing I would say is Justice Sotomayor also, as I quote in my book, says he's a man that cares deeply about people and the institution. And why do those matter? Why does that second point matter? Because as I recount in the beginning, he cares about homeless people. He befriends homeless people. He befriends people in the RV parking lots. But he also befriends all of the people he meets. Even his critics who meet him becomes friends with him. So one story recently came out how he was a member of the Horatio Alger Association. I admit my ignorance. I had not, and I'm embarrassed, had not heard of that. But I read the recounting of it, that it benefited something like 31,000 to 35,000 underprivileged kids with college or with academic scholarships. 
That should be no surprise that Justice Thomas is a member of an association like that. In fact, I'd ask, why aren't we all like I'd love to be a member of an association like that, that benefits underprivileged kids. He himself was one of those kids. I am sure he befriended everyone there, whether it's the kids or the people on the board. And I think it, the stories about Harlan Crow, it, imag- it, it doesn't surprise me that he's made friends with people like Harlan Crow. I've never met Mr. Crow, but it just doesn't surprise me that he has met people, whoever he meets, he becomes friends with and befriends them. As to the disclosure things, I would point out a couple things. One is that I think this allegation, interestingly enough, was brought up. I recently learned in 2011, 2012, you might know better than me. I don't know the specific details, but I know it was referred to the Financial Disclosure Committee. And they said Justice Thomas did nothing wrong. The same exact allegations that are coming up now. So that that, too, is interesting to me. But I don't know the exact details of the differences of what's going on now other than to say that I think it's been referred to the Financial Disclosure Committee, so they too will pass on that again. Taking this away from Justice Thomas for a minute, um, uh, maybe thinking about it a little more broadly, uh, I was curious as I was thinking about this, um, you know, I think the journalists believe that federal judges, like all public officials, should be held accountable to the public. Um, But I also think that most of us understand the idea that the federal judiciary was specifically designed not to be responsive to politics. Um, uh, And so I wonder, um, you're not elected, Your Honor, obviously by design, uh, but I wonder how you think about accountability for the federal judiciary um, and how we square that with uh, the other two branches, it's clear how that accountability takes hold. Um, it's not as clear, I think, for federal judges. What do, you, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think it's a really hard question. I think it's a great question because I think you want to strike a balance, right? What you want is federal judges to be insulated from politics, as you noted. And lifetime tenure lets us do so, so we can read the law and often, right, protect the little guy against the government, the things that originalism, I believe, counsels that the courts do, um, and not, not be subject to political recourse or other recourse. At the same time, we internally have an obligation, and I think the court, Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Kagan have talked about this, that they internally hold each other accountable. They have an ethics code internally where they hold each other accountable. I think if you look over time, the system has worked. The checks and balances within the system itself has worked. We have not been perfect by any stretch of the imagination in holding each other accountable, but we've we've tried our best and we're getting better at it. And I think no one is At least I haven't heard a better solution than what we've got now. And I I do firmly believe that the nine people on the court, as I've said before publicly, are people of integrity. I know almost all of them. And I really think if the public knew them like I knew them, they would truly believe they're all people of integrity that are just trying their best to get the result right. And they do hold each other accountable internally. It's just not something you see outside. Judge, um, you have a fascinating background. We could spend the whole program just talking about you, I think. Um, uh, I learned recently that neither of your parents were lawyers. Uh, And so I wanted to ask how you got into the law, uh, because I think it's kind of a fun story. But maybe um, in addition to that, when you realized that the law was something that you were going to make a career out of. Yeah. So it's interesting because, as you said, my dad came here. He was dirt poor, very much like Justice Thomas, even poorer, if you can imagine, raised by a single mother the same way. Um, His dad sadly passed away when he was two years old at a difficult time. Both my parents are from India. He was raised there. His mom, he was the one child his mom could afford to save up for a one-way ticket, gave him a one-way ticket to America and a $5 bill and told him to make something of himself. He really did. And when my sister or I would complain growing up, he'd say, this is the greatest country in the world. If you can't accomplish it here, you can't accomplish it anywhere. Just like Justice Thomas's grandfather's old man can't story, my dad would not accept any kind of whining or complaining and expected us to do our best. Uh, 
as everyone knows, that uh, at least it has Indian immigrants as parents. There are some kind of crown jewel professions. One of them is the medical field. My sister is the crown jewel in the family. She, she's a doctor, and uh, my parents were thrilled with that. When I decided to go to law school, I was in college trying to figure out what to do. I had become, I had went to school to fulfill kind of my parent, my parents' dream of becoming a business person, went to the business school, became enamored with philosophy at Boston College and took up a bunch of philosophy courses. And obviously law was a natural follow from that, the logic and the pursuit. When I called my dad and told him I was going to law school, he, he said, why would you go to grad school to work an hourly job? In other words, that was his perception of what law school was all about. So for all of those out there who are thinking about it, I encourage you to do it, even if that is the remark you get from your parents, because sometimes if if it really is your passion, it's important you pursue it. And it really became a passion of mine. I, I really loved being a trial lawyer and the opportunity to become a trial lawyer was so important to me. And being able to what I believed is vindicate wrongs. This country has given me so much and I thought it was the least I could do to give it back. You know, uh, this term, the Supreme Court uh, reversed the Sixth Circuit in a case involving a deaf student who sued his school over a subpar education. I believe you were the majority writer in that, if I'm remembering correctly, Uh, On the other hand, they essentially upheld your reasoning uh, by declining to grant a case of a man who created a parody website of his police department. That was a case that most Americans will remember uh, because of the brief uh, by The Onion, the satirical newspaper. I wonder what it's like for you um, as an appeals court judge when one of your opinions goes up to the Supreme Court. Is that nerve wracking? Is it enjoyable in some way? Um, Do you read deeply the amicus briefs? Do you listen to the argument? Uh, what is that? Or are you too, too busy dealing with what's on the docket in front of you? What, what is that like for you um, when your cases go up? Yeah, I try, believe it or not, not to pay too much attention to it. I think it's important that the court do their job and we do ours. And it's uh, what I pay attention to is whatever they announce. In other words, I don't pay attention to the briefs. I don't pay attention to the argument, but I pay a lot of attention to the opinion. I like to understand and appreciate where they think I got it wrong and where they think I got it right. Um, Denying cert doesn't mean, by the way, just because they deny cert doesn't mean they think I got it right. And it's important lower court judges not read too much into that and be willing to revisit our own views when we later believe we got it wrong. And so, uh, I think those two things really guide me. One, make sure you read their opinions and understand where you think you got it right and where you think you got it wrong, where they think you got it right, and where they think you got it wrong. And second, do your day job to the best of your ability. I understand uh, you never spoke to Justice Thomas uh, during the writing of this book. Um, uh, why is that? Uh, did you did you send him a copy? Ultimately, uh, do you hope to to speak with him about it? I did ultimately send him a copy about. I think two week, you know, maybe a week after it came out, someone reminded me that he might not have seen it. I didn't talk to him because I thought it important that I try to capture his voice without. I think we have a subjective view. In other words, I have my own view of my own voice, but it would be it's nice, at least for me. It's nice when others tell me what they think my voice is, because then I can understand if I'm actually capturing what I'm trying to capture or something's coming out of my opinions. that's unintended. For example, I don't know care. I just, I'll be very blunt. I don't care about offending corporations or government in my opinions, but I want to be very careful not to offend individuals, if that makes sense, especially the losing party. The losing party is lost and you want to write for them and hopefully explain it to them in a dispassionate way such that they, they're not going to agree with you, but hopefully they can understand the logic of your opinion. And I think that's really important in your opinions. That's my goal. I think we all have goals with what we do with our opinions. Some were very clear. Justice Thomas, I think, would agree that he has a strong originalist voice. I didn't want to ask him and say, boy, I discovered you also have a strong, what I would call black nationalist voice in the way of Frederick Douglass, Thomas Sowell, um, some Martin Luther King, and even some Malcolm X. And I didn't want to ask him that. I wanted to put it down and have it be my own independent kind of review of his opinions. 
And same thing about the people. The, the title, The People's Justice, comes not only because he's honoring the will of the people when he honors the words of the law, but because of how often he cares about and notes empathy for the very people in the case. And I'm curious if he intends to do that or it's just a product of his own work or it's something he's doing without thinking about. And I didn't get to ask him those questions. But, yes, I hope to someday ask him all those questions. Well, I hope you get that chance to um, judge the part. It's been a great pleasure speaking with you. Um, I'd encourage uh, listeners to uh, pick up a copy of the book, no matter what you think about Justice Thomas or originalism. Um, uh, the People's Justice, I think, has something to say for both supporters and critics of um of this line of thought, um, and it's told in a really gripping, engaging way. Um, thank you, Judge Thapar, for your work on this book and for being here. Thank you very much for having me, John. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to this week's Afterwards podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, listen to C-SPAN's podcast about books. Learn about the latest nonfiction books and best-selling authors. In each episode, we report on bestsellers' lists and book reviews from around the country. You'll also hear authors talking about their latest books and insider interviews with nonfiction book publishing industry experts. 